not Sean Dudo. Sean Dudo is sick this morning, so I will be sharing in his place a reading from the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. I will be reading in French. Paul, apôtre de Jésus-Christ, par la volonté de Dieu, pour annoncer la promesse de la vie qui est en Jésus-Christ, à Timothée, mon enfant bien-aimé, que la grâce, la miséricorde et la paix te soient données de la part de Dieu, le Père, et de Jésus-Christ, notre Seigneur. Je rends grâce à Dieu que mes ancêtres ont servi et que je sers avec une conscience pure de ce que nuit et jour je me souviens continuellement de toi dans mes prières, me rappelant tes larmes et désirant te voir afin d'être rempli de joie, gardant le souvenir de la foi sincère qui est en toi, qui habita d'abord dans ton aile, loi et dans ta mère Unis, et qui, j'en suis persuadé, habite aussi en toi. C'est pourquoi je t'exhorte à ranimer la flamme du don de Dieu que tu as reçu par l'imposition de mes mains. Car ce n'est pas un esprit de timidité que Dieu nous a donné. Au contraire, son esprit nous remplit de force, d'amour et de sagesse. N'aie donc point honte de témoignage à rendre notre Seigneur ni de moi son prisonnier, mais souffre avec moi pour évangier par la puissance de Dieu. Il nous a sauvés et nous a dressé une sainte vocation, non à cause de nos œuvres, mais selon son propre dessein et selon la grâce qui nous a été donnée en Jésus-Christ avant les temps éternels et qui a été manifestée maintenant par la venue de notre Sauveur Jésus-Christ, qui a réduit la mort à l'impuissance et a mis en évidence la vie et l'immortalité par l'Évangile. C'est pour cet Évangile que j'ai été établi prédicateur et apôtre, charge d'instruire les païens. Et c'est à cause de cela que je souffre ces choses. Mais je n'ai au point honte, car je sais en qui j'ai cru et je suis persuadé qui a la puissance de garder mon dépôt jusqu'à ce jour-là. Retiens dans la foi et dans l'amour qui est en Jésus-Christ la modèle dans saint parole que tu as reçu de moi. Garde le bon dépôt par le Saint-Esprit qui habite en nous. The word of God for the people of God. Cristóbal sabe muchas lenguas, verdad? Shall we pray? Everlasting, ever loving God, come to you this morning from many different walks of life and many different perspectives, seeking to know you more. Help us to not lose sight of the fact, O oh God, that in doing so, we come to seek to know each other more. So we ask then that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The last time I preached on the pastorals, that's First and Second Timothy and the book of Titus in the New Testament. They're called the pastorals. I suggested that Paul didn't write them. Uh, preaching today on a text from Second Timothy, I want to be clear that there's not a consensus on that. Biblical scholars widely agree that Paul didn't write them, but there's no undeniable proof to that effect. I stand by my suggestion, but I mention this because I want to be careful with points that are brought up from the pulpit about who wrote that. But what is indisputably true is that the pastorals contain messages written by real people to real people with real experiences in earliest 
Christianity. These were people living two and three generations after the death and resurrection of Christ. And so they're trying to take care of the church with intentionality and with integrity. So while we can wrestle with what the author of the pastorals has to say, the message is for all of us. And what is that message? The message is for us to take care of that good thing that's been entrusted to us. Hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you heard from me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus and protect this good thing that has been placed in your trust through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Take care of that good thing. Now while my Generation X peers get the fine young cannibals tune out of their head, you're welcome, wait for it. The next question is, what is the good thing that has been entrusted to Timothy to protect? The good thing, the good treasure, as other versions of the text say, is the message of Jesus and the example that he sets for all of us to follow. I want to get us on the same page about what we've been up to for the last several months here at Friends Congregational Church. This community of faith turned 40 this past December. And instead of just celebrating with one big birthday, we decided to treat it as an opportunity to look ahead and see where we want to go and who we want to be in the next 40 years. We hired a strategic planning consultant, Elizabeth Resnick, who led us in a couple of planning sessions at the end of April. And out of those planning sessions, we formed an ad hoc visioning and writing team composed of a handful of church members who attended those sessions and associate pastor Trent Williams and me. And the purpose of the visioning and writing team has been to revisit our congregation's vision and mission statements because while our current statements are good, any church's vision and mission statements need to be revisited from time to time. And in our case in particular at Friends Church, even though the scores of people who have come into this congregation over the last several years have come in large part because of our identity as expressed through those statements, we are not the same church that we were when we wrote them. God's Spirit is moving in this place. And so we need to keep up with where that Spirit is moving to, where God is leading us by revisiting and updating the words that best describe who we are now as a faith community. In short, we need to take a page from the recipients of 2 Timothy and keep treating the church with intentionality and with integrity. So the next step in our strategic planning process is going to be this church-wide planning session that Elizabeth Resnick will lead for us later this year on pathways and those pathways are going to help us map out paths that lead us to this new vision and that carry out our updated mission. The visioning and writing team has been meeting monthly for the last four months. We've spent hours together in dialogue, in prayer, in silence, in more dialogue, coming up with the words that might articulate what our vision and mission are. Some of you participated in the online survey giving feedback to an initial draft of those statements. You had a lot to say, and we did our best to listen. We've made changes accordingly, and at the congregational meeting a couple of weeks from today, you'll get the opportunity to hear those updated statements, not vote on them at that time, but to see where we are in the process, digest them a bit. But I wanted to use today's sermon to help us understand the latest version of the mission statement. So here's a sneak peek of the latest mission statement draft. United by Jesus' example, we seek to live faithfully, love limitlessly, and serve boldly. Now, we're just going to look at the first part of that this morning. United by Jesus' example. Well, Jesus exemplifies his message. So first of all, what is Jesus' message? I want you to help me out with this for just a minute. I want you to tell me, brainstorm with me, in one sentence or less, what is Jesus' message? 
Go. Love, Love one another. Love thy neighbor. Love God. Forgiving. Forgiving. Serve one another. Preach good news to the poor and announce the year of the Lord's favor. Welcome the stranger. Say it again. Feed the hungry. Okay. This is good. And we could keep going this way. Thank you for what you've shared. Keep thinking about this. Jesus' message is about putting the dignity and well-being of people over and above the letter of the law. Jesus' message is about recognizing social injustice and then treating that with justice that isn't punitive, but that's restorative, right? Jesus' message is to prioritize children, to stand up for women, to bring the public's attention to the marginalized, and then to bring the margins to the middle. Jesus' message brings good news to the poor, and it's about calling out systemic powers that maintain systems of cyclical poverty. Jesus' message is about living our lives without fear, without shame, about looking at one another as children of God, and about treating each other with compassion and grace. And how did Jesus exemplify this message? He exemplified his message by meeting people where they were in their life at that point, literally and figuratively. He exemplified his message by spending time with people from all walks of life, from the Roman centurion and the religious elites to the despised tax collectors and the vilified prostitutes and the outcast lepers. When society said, don't go there, Jesus exemplified his message by always going there. Jesus exemplified his message by having a conversation with a Samaritan woman at a well, by putting a child on his knee, by going off to a quiet place to pray when life got stressful, take note, by looking at people and loving them, by actually laying down his life for his friends. Everywhere he went, everything he did, everyone he talked to and touched, Jesus exemplified his message with courage. Now back to the mission statement. We are united by Jesus' example. Now, whether that phrase actually makes it into the final draft of the mission statement, the truth remains that we are united by Jesus' example. You remember that when Jesus was talking to the crowds and his mom and his brothers were outside trying to get his attention and someone said to him, hey, your mom and your brothers, they want to talk to you. And Jesus said, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And then he stretched out his hand toward his followers and said, look, here are my mother and my brothers. And then he said, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Now Jesus' message is our clearest understanding of the will of God. And whoever does that message, whoever hears it and exemplifies it, is united as family. We are united by Christ's example. As we reflect on the identity of this community of faith and revisit that mission statement, I bring this up because of one of the most powerful, transformative things about this body of Christ. And that's the appreciation of and respect for and reverence we have for the family we choose. Timothy is instructed to not forget his grandma Lois and his mom Eunice because they exemplified the message of Christ for him, which I think is this fun corrective that Timothy has from going to saying that women need to be quiet to saying honor them because they taught you everything you know. <laughs> we may have people like Lois and Eunice in our bloodline too, but now we're in this place called Friends Church where hardly any of us come from a United Church of Christ background and where hardly any of us are second generation members in this 40-year-old community of faith. Show of hands, raise your hand if you have a parent in this congregation and keep them up. Raise your hand if you have a parent in this congregation. Very good. Now, if you are 18 years of age or 
younger, put your hand down. <laughs> That's it. We are the family we choose. We're united by the example of Christ. We're family. And for me, being the only one in my immediate family who moved to another town, and having done this when Stacy and I had an infant son who was the first grandchild on either side of the family, this is a tremendous encouragement for me. There's something holy about the family we choose. Just ask some of our LGBTQ siblings in this house who have endured the silent treatment from blood relatives or worse yet, hostility or even outright estrangement from parents or siblings or aunts or uncles or cousins. Ask them about the saving grace of the family we choose. It's those testimonies among so many others in this body of Christ that have the power to transform us all to save us all from exemplifying the worldly ideologies that contradict Jesus' message. There's a redemptive holiness in the family we choose. Here's some news that you might not have heard about lately. In the past five years, more transgender people have been killed in Texas than any other state. And nearly half the deaths occurred in Dallas. The American Medical Association has called it an, uh, an epidemic of violence. And this epidemic is threatening to tear families apart. Robin Crow lost two grandchildren to this epidemic this year. In May, her granddaughter Malaysia Booker was found dead in East Dallas, and two weeks later, Malaysia's cousin Chanel Lindsay's body was found. She'd been strangled and beaten. And like Malaysia and Chanel, Grandma Crow is black and transgender. And the three of them didn't share a blood bond, but they were united through experience. They formed a chosen family. Grandma Crow started a transgender radio show this year called Transfusion that brings trans women of color together to share their experiences and to take care of each other. Crow says... I look at everybody who's lost their life, they could just as easily have been me. And then on September 20th, another trans woman of color, a Latina, was shot in Northwest Dallas. It has Grandma Crow's chosen family asking, what does this, why does this keep happening to us? What does this have to do with this chosen family here in College Station, Texas? I know that intersectionality is a buzzword, but hear me out. The intersectionality of the lived experiences of people of color and of gender nonconforming people and of women and of sexual minorities exist in this chosen family. And those lived experiences are a part of how we understand the message of Jesus and how we go about exemplifying it together, no matter who we are or where we come from. There's a transformative saving grace in that family dynamic, and it turns our attention to Dallas with the prophetic recognition that an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So like us, Timothy is exhorted to not treat this good thing with a spirit of timidity, to be courageous in exemplifying the message of Jesus. God didn't give us a spirit that is timid, but one that is powerful, loving, and self-controlled. But I don't feel courageous most days. Courage can be intimidating. If I were to ask for another show of hands of who all considers themselves to be courageous, I don't think we'd have many hands go up. But here's the good news about biblical courage. Biblical courage is not about bravery or valor. Biblical courage is about openness and vulnerability. The root of the word courage is akin to the Spanish word corazón, which means heart. And it's not talking about the physical organ. It's talking about the heart that gives strength to our openness and vulnerability, a courage of the heart. Biblical courage is about making ourselves open 
and vulnerable to one another. Open and vulnerable to our neighbor and to their lived experience. So as the world around us changes demographically and culturally, and with white rage, as the expression has been coined by Carol Alexander, as white rage it pushes back against all this change, and it becomes so tempting and easy to slip into that rage and become complicit to that rage, for white males to choose to show up in a congregation where a Sunday school class is learning about racial insensitivities and about racial justice and to sit in a sanctuary that explores the lived experiences of our migrant neighbors seeking asylum at the border is a faithful act of openness and vulnerability that's not timid but courageous. And when 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning remains the most segregated hour in America, for people of color to choose to show up in this predominantly white space and to sing and to pray and to worship the God of us all, making themselves open and vulnerable is as courageous as heaven. For those with differing physical abilities, navigating their way through a world that largely does not include them, to show up in this space that is still working on ways to become more accessible, making themselves open and vulnerable to our shared recognition of how far we have to go is the opposite of timidity. And beloved community, what I'm saying is this is a sanctuary of courageous people united by Jesus' example, seeking to live faithfully, love limitlessly, and serve boldly. So let me leave you with this. I was trying to wrap this all up because I know I haven't been doing the whole like storytelling thing. Yesterday we had a big barbecue in this house. And before the barbecue, yesterday morning I ran a half marathon. Because Chris, Chris Hoffman and I know that we run so we can eat. <laughs> and we ran the half marathon on Boonville Road. And there were people out there, just a few, not very many, holding up signs of encouragement for their loved ones with witty things like on a scale of 1 to 10, you're a 13.1 and stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> and one person was holding up this sign that said, I trained for months to hold this sign. <laughs> and, I, and I just thought, yep, that's what it's all about. We're all in this. She may not have trained to run the half marathon, but she was committed to it in her own way. In our own way, we're all a part of this thing called church. And we're all committed. We're all united by Jesus' example that the author of 2 Timothy witnessed to in his letter when he wrote, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race. Whether we're pounding the pavement or holding up a sign that inspires our loved one to keep on going, whether we are slicing the brisket or bringing a dessert to the table, whatever it is that we are doing, we are in this thing. We're all running this race. So that whenever we come to that point in life, when we look back and say, I have fought the fight, I have fought the fight and I have run the race, we'll be able to see how that fight and that good run was a part of a community of faith. How our openness and vulnerability to where God's Spirit was leading us contributed to a body of Christ that exemplified the message of Jesus. How that courage was a part of a church where the world from the outside looking in glanced at it and said, you know, I had never thought about that before, but it turns out black lives matter and trans lives matter because they matter to Jesus. I hadn't thought about it before, but it turns out that to take care of the earth and make sure that there's plenty of it to go around in abundance for generation after generation matters because it matters to Jesus. I hadn't thought about it before, but it turns out that I need to look out for the oppressed and the marginalized and to bring the overlooked pieces of this world back into the center to be about mending and reconciliation because that matters to Jesus. I hadn't thought about it before, but it matters to love God with the fullness of who I am and to love my neighbor as myself because that matters to Jesus. I hadn't thought about it before, but when I look at myself in the mirror, I recognize that I need to live my life unashamed and recognizing that I am a beloved child of God because that matters 
to Jesus. And what matters to Jesus is what unites us. And it's what matters more than anything else. Amen.